are resuming in the Sermon on the Mount, we're talking about the Beatitudes, right? Those opening phrases and, and every single week kind of refreshing us on that. The, the word Beatitude is, is just derived from the Latin term, the Latin translation of the word which we get blessed from. So that means simply happy or blissful or fortunate. And so Jesus is saying if you want those things in your life, how to be happy, how to be, how to be fortunate, how to be considered blissful, then, then these are the things that will mark you. And remember, we're talking about marking us as kingdom citizens, right? So this is not what we expect everyone in the world to understand and embrace and live out. This is for those of us who are Christians, who are following Christ, part of his kingdom, having his image formed in us, this is what we will begin to look like. So these Beatitudes begin in the first part of Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 3. Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So tonight we're going to come in on this fourth item in our list of beatitudes and we're going to we're going to build, right? I, every week I'm kind of pulling this along because I think Jesus is giving a progression. I think these are intentionally ordered and arranged. And so we began in the first beatitude with a, a posture being humble in spirit, right? Being poor in spirit, recognizing our spiritual poverty, which le- leads to, if you know, I have nothing, the, 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 the famous phrase from Augustus, top lot, right? Nothing in my hands I, I, I have, but simply to the cross I cling. This is the idea of we have nothing to offer God. We are poor in spirit. When we know that, we mourn. <laughs> we, know, it's, it, we feel this sorrow that we have nothing to offer God. In fact, we are sinners who deserve nothing good from God. And that leads to this mourning and sorrow over sin and puts us in a posture, we said last week, of being meek, being, being humble before God, knowing we have nothing good, we can give nothing good, we need everything by grace. And so this, this humility and meekness, both in heart at our inability, and then in, in consequence, our actions, how we live, should be marked by meekness, not by pride, not by assumption, not by arrogance, not by we deserve, but, but rather knowing we are, we are beggars. As Luther said, this is, this is true. So Jesus now, in this fourth one here, verse 6 of Matthew chapter 5 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. Again, uh, this is counterintuitive, right? What Jesus is saying is counterintuitive to the natural position of our hearts. We would say, blessed are those who are full and comfortable, for they are satisfied. And notice the change in the, the term there, right? For us, being blessed, being happy, being fortunate is you're not hungry, you're not thirsty, you are currently satisfied. But that is not what Jesus says. Our culture says this. Everything from the Snickers commercial, right, which tells us that Snickers satisfies and all those other candy bars don't, right, to Coca-Cola. Again, we've drawn on them for illustrations. They're just a wealth of cultural influence, right? They tell us satisfaction comes from the genuine stuff. So buy a Coke, right? To A1 Steak Sauce, which tells us they're a bottle of satisfaction, right? That's quite a, quite a claim. To the old Camel Cigarettes advertising that said they were the genuine thing, they were the most satisfying smoke, right? That's old school. All the way to the Rolling Stones singing about how they just can't get no satisfaction, right? People want satisfaction, happiness, fulfillment right here, right now, and we'll do whatever we can to get it because that is, is the aim of happiness, right? To be satisfied right now in this moment. But Jesus says no Contrary to what we believe to be true, it's actually the opposite. It is better to hunger and thirst for righteousness now so that we can be satisfied in the future. In the parallel of Luke chapter 6, verse 21, we see that even more clearly. Jesus there says, Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied, referring to the future, right? So so in this life, what Jesus is saying here, and of course, remember, when, when we say Jesus is saying this, this isn't just some 
some perspective, some alternate view on this is God incarnate speaking to us. This is the one who's created us and designed us. He's the one who then came, took on flesh, lived a perfect human life, fully embodying humanity as it was meant to be, what you and I could never do on our own. This, this is Jesus saying to us, you want true happiness, you want true fulfillment, you want true satisfaction, here's where you find it. And it's in these things that our hearts don't naturally, don't naturally want to do. He says that we are to seek and pursue, or to be hungry and thirsty. That's the, the imagery that he's using here for righteousness. That's the best thing he says for us. And that will lead to us being truly satisfied and truly happy. So, so let's unpack this, this image that, that Jesus uses here, because he uses a, an imagery, a word picture that, that all of us can relate to, right? He uses this phrase, to hunger and thirst, which provides a very vivid image to every one of us that we can draw from our own experiences, right? All of us have been hungry before. Some of us may be hungry now, depending on what time you had your lunch, right? For most of us, hunger is something we're, we're pretty familiar with because we get hungry really in, in our day and age compared to, to kind of the historical, we get hungry pretty quickly after we've eaten, Right? Like, uh, my, my dad was up last weekend, and he was saying, you know, I'm, he's, he's retired now, and so he cooks for himself, and he doesn't want to do that more than, like, once a day. So he's like, I just kind of eat once a day, and you guys having, like, breakfast, and then we had lunch, and then we had dinner. He's like, man, this is so much food. Like, I'm just not hungry. You know, I eat once, and that's, that's it. And, like, well, that doesn't work for my children. They are constantly hungry. They're always asking for, for food, right? You, you know what that's like. Some of us ha- have gone days without eating before. I don't think anyone's probably been, in, in our context, you know, in, in extreme hunger from, from very prolonged periods. Maybe some of us have had that experience. But most of us can relate to at least going a day or so without food, right? We practiced fasting as a church just, just last year. Um, so many of us were, were giving up at least one meal, if not uh, all the meals of one day, and, and feeling, okay, there, there's hunger pains that come from this. We begin to long for food, Right? Maybe you've had to do that because of a, of a medical procedure. You know, you can't eat. And it's always, that's always the, the one I hear people complain the most about, right? Oh, I've got to have this surgery tomorrow and I can't eat. And by the time you get to the, you know, you're heading to the hospital, you're thinking, I could just stop off and get breakfast. But no, I can't because I'm now, but now I'm hungry, right? We, just, we feel it more. We all know what it is like to be hungry for food in some way. And the hungrier you get, the more all-consuming the thought of food becomes, Right? <laughs> Like, you, you, you may not love McDonald's cheeseburgers, but if you're really hungry and you see those golden arches, you're like, man, I could go for a cheeseburger, right? You just, and, and you kind of want to pull in there and go get that. It becomes dominating in our thoughts. But even more of a reality in terms of driving our passions than hunger, I think, is, is thirst, all of us in here know what it's like to be really thirsty before. We may not have gone long enough to get really, really, truly hungry, but all of us have probably at some point in our lives had that experience where we got really, really thirsty. We can go a lot longer without food than we can water, right? And so, I, I mean, I can vividly remember summers as a kid, right, going outside and playing, and, and it'd be hot and maybe out riding bikes on the, the blacktop or something. Just begin to get really thirsty. That heat's kind of beaten down, and that, the heat's coming up off of the ground, and you're thinking, man, I really, really could, could go for a drink and really begin to long for a drink and get thirsty and, and want to go get something to quench your thirst. And it can become, it can become very very driving, right? Almost all consuming. I got to get water. I got to get something to drink. When I was um, in Israel last year, uh, one of the things that I, I told Malia, and then um, I, I found it to be striking, and, 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 and I don't know, it felt very profound to me, and she didn't think so. She was mocking me for it. To all of you, I'm quite aware of the things she was saying. What I found was I, I went up on this hill called, called Tel Azika. Uh, and Tel Azika is this hill that overlooks the site that we are we're pretty much certain is where the battle between David and Goliath took place. I have a photo of it. If you'll put the photo up there for me. Okay, so I'm on top of the hill, and down here, you, you see where that, that road is going? There's these fields, right? On, on the field on the right, it, or the field on the left, it's one of those two places, is for sure where the battle of David and Goliath took place. We don't know. The, the road's kind of right in the middle of it. But there's a dry creek bed, a dry stream that, that bed that's running through there. And we know that's the exact stream David went to, got the rocks from, and then went out onto the field and, and fought Goliath. So it's, it's right down there. Now, I'm not all that high up. And we're in a part of, of Israel that you can see all this greenery around me. 
Okay, so there's water in this area. It's not the most extreme areas of, of Israel. This is a pretty nice area, but I got to the top of this hill, and I, we, we had to hike up from you know, where the bus can go to. You gotta climb up the hill, and then we're standing on top of the hill, and all those trees, they go, they go down the hill. There's nothing on top of this hill mound. As so you're just standing there, the sun's right above us. It's kind of midday, and I'm just feeling like it's hot. And the temperature wasn't all, all that high, really. It wasn't like, you know, 104 degrees or something. It was just standing there in the sun, beating down on me, having climbed up this hill. I'm standing there thinking, imagining the Philistines and imagining the Israelites in, in armor, right? Having climbed up here, encamped on this hill. They're holding a lot of weight, and they've got metal and all this kind of stuff. So I'm thinking, man, you know, water is really, really important, if you're encamped up on this hill up here and you don't have a good supply of water, you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're not going to be here long. You're going to get down. You're going to go somewhere else. This isn't a good defensive position because of the heat and because of the lack of water if you don't have good supplies, right? Now, I tell her all this from this location, and she's like, really, you went all the way to Israel to, you know, say the sun's hot. Like, Woo, yeah, so glad you went. You know, we're doing great here. Okay, I know that. But here, here's what I thought of that on, on this was like the second or third day when I was in Israel. A few days later, we went to another location and, and put up the photo of the second location for me. Okay, this is maybe more of what you think about when you think about Israel. This is a desert area between uh, Jerusalem uh, headed out to the south. And so the more southern part that you get to go south in Israel, the more it turns into desert. And that's what you, you have here. This is just desert stretching out as far that way as you can see, and then the other way, the way like I'm looking at the camera, it's the same thing. It's desert going all that way. And all these photos, I have my silly hat that Malia bought me. So I, she's like, here, you need this. And then she's over here like, you look like a dork. And I'm like, now all my photos have my dorky hat. Thanks so much. But anyway, so here's this desert area. Now, out here, it's even worse than staying on that hilltop. And we got off the bus at this location, and all we did was walk across the road. And, and instantly, we're sweating. It is just, it is scorching hot on the sand, on the rocks, and we're like, we need water. Like, we were just riding the air-conditioned bus, but standing across the road with very little exertion, we're like, it is hot, and this thirst became overwhelming. In fact, one of the guys stopped listening as we were doing a little teaching, we were talking about all this. One of the guys just turned around and walked back to the bus. He's like, I'm just too thirsty. Well, we gotta go get a water, and off he went, because it was hot, and that thirst became a consuming thought. You know what it's like to hunger. You know what it's like to thirst, right? So what Jesus is saying here is this. What you and I need in order to have truly blessed lives, truly happy lives, is not just a posture that says, hey, you know, I'm, I'm open to going after a little bit of righteousness, adding a little bit of righteousness in. It's a nice little part to my life. He's saying, no, true blessedness will come when you and I hunger and thirst. We have a deep longing and a, and a desperation for righteousness. And we will pursue righteousness like we will pursue food when we are hungry or drink when we are thirsty, right? So this is the type of, of posture that you hear in texts like Psalm 42, 1 and 2, right? As the deer pants for a flowing stream, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before my God? Or, or Psalm 63, 1. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as a, in a dry and weary land where there is no water. As in standing there in the desert. My, I'm longing for you like I'm longing for refreshment in a place like that. Now let's be honest. Is that, is that if we're honest with our hearts, uh, honest with ourselves about who we are, is that really our own spiritual posture in our lives most of the time? I mean, those things sound great as songs, right? Was anyone else thinking about the songs based on those psalms, right? They sound great to sing. They look great as decorations we hang up on the wall. But if we take that and we go, is this the posture of my soul? Is this my heart's longing? Do I hunger and thirst for God like that? I think many of us would say, okay, we're not really living out our spirituality to that degree. That's a, that's a little more extreme than where we are, right? But that's the imagery Jesus is drawing on when he says this is what the truly blessed, the truly happy life will, will look like. God desires for us to have a spiritual hunger for him and for his ways of righteousness because of this. It, when we focus on him and when we go to him for what we need, we will find satisfaction with him. 
That's the goal. It's always to get us to him, to draw us into relationship, into closeness, into proximity with God. So notice how incredible it is that that God gives us an invitation to deal with our hunger, to deal with our thirst. He wants us to be this way, and then hear what he says when we are that way. Isaiah 55, 1 to 3. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. For why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good. Delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me here that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant. You hear God's invitation to us. Uh, You need to be hungry. You need to be thirsty for righteousness. And when you are, come to me. That's what he's saying. Be this way in your spiritual life, and then come to me. You don't need to go somewhere else to find satisfaction. In fact, he says, why would you go? Spend your life, spend your labor, spend your money on things that won't satisfy. Come instead to me, right? Jesus echoes this invitation to come in his ministry personally. John 7, 37, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. I think there's an irony here that that Jesus chose this moment, right? It's the last day of what? feast. What have they been doing? Eating and drinking for days, right? This is the great day, the last day of it. And Jesus says, okay, now if any of you are hungry and thirsty, come to me. Hungry and thirsty? Jesus, we've been, we've been feasting. We got everything we need. We're for content. We're happy. We're, we're satisfied. Jesus says, you shouldn't be. All of, all of the Old Testament system, all the sacrificial system, all the religious festivals, right? They were designed to produce hunger and thirst in us for the things of God, for righteousness. Jesus was saying, if, if this did what it was supposed to do, you should be thirsty. And if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. Back in John 6, just a few verses before that, he said he was the bread of life, right? That all who ate of him would never hunger again, right? This invitation, so come to him. In John's vision at the end of time, we read this in Revelation chapter 7, verse 13 to 17. Then one of the elders addressed John, saying, Who are these, clothed in the white robes, and from where have they come? And I said to him, Sir, <laughs> you know. So he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Notice his presence. Listen to verse 16 now. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. You hear the invitation in those first two passages, and then you see this fulfillment here. This is what happens. God will bring us close into his presence, and then he will fill us. We won't be hungry. We won't be thirsty. The heat of the sun won't wear on us anymore. We'll be satisfied in him. See, in hungering and thirsting for righteousness in this life, we get the blessing of getting to be closer to God. And that's what, that's what the blessed life, the happy life really is all about. It's, a, it's closeness with God, proximity with him. Ultimately, we have to find this satisfaction in him because righteousness that we're supposed to long for and seek after, it is him. Like he is that perfectly, right? Psalm 119, 137, righteous are you, O Yahweh, right are all your rules. Psalm 97, 6, the heavens proclaim God's righteousness and all the people see his glory. Psalm eleven seven, for Yahweh is righteous and he loves righteous deeds and the upright shall behold his face. If we are to hunger and thirst after righteousness, that's not just an abstract concept. It is the person of God himself. It's a longing to be close to him, to be with him, being like him and walking in his ways. That is the only way we will find true satisfaction, true happiness, true blessedness in our lives. And Isaiah 55, as we go back to it, tells us what pursuing righteousness is. Also entails. Notice in in Isaiah 55, 6 and 7, it says this So seek Yahweh while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to Yahweh that he may have compassion on him, to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. The, The call to come close to God 
to come into a, an intimate relationship with him, to come into proximity with God and his presence and his blessing expressly means that we have to, pers- to leave behind wickedness and unrighteousness in order to enter into the presence of true righteousness. We have to turn away from our natural state into the state that Jesus enables us to live in by his Holy Spirit, by his sanctification, by sanctifying work in us, right? So in the New Testament, Paul will write this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 22 to 23. So flee from youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So, so turn away from youthful passions, right? And, and, and pursue righteousness and love and faith and peace and do so with other believers, right? That's what he says, those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So have nothing to do, verse 23, with foolish, ignorant controversies, for you know that they breed quarrels. Foolish, ignorant controversies are on this side. Flee from these things, right? Have nothing to do with them. So There is a call to ignore and disengage from a lot of uh, mainstream media and maybe all of social media, right? Like, uh, yeah. Flee from things that would distract us. Flee from these, these quarrels and things that would tie us up and pursue righteousness and love and joy and peace. And then in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, he says, For understand this, in the last days there will come times of difficulties. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, Proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And verse 5 blows my mind. All that stuff, he says, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. What about that seems godly? Any of those things, right? They seem to be the complete antithesis. What he's saying, though, is that people will be filled with all of those things and still pretend to be godly. He says, have nothing to do with that. They have an appearance of it, but they do not have the power of true righteousness. So avoid such people, right? That's crazy to me. These things are all too natural, all too quick, all too easy to come into our hearts and lives, and we're all too accepting of them. That's why he can say this massive list of things can be in people and we would still say they have some godliness in them. Mark 7, 20 through 23, Jesus tells us, for, it is what, they com- it, for what comes out of a person is what defiles him. From, if for from within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, Envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All of these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Paul will write in Galatians 5, 19 to 21, For the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before, do, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Right? The Bible actually gives, gives a lot longer and more detailed lists of unrighteousness and all these different things because there are so many different ways the human heart will go to unrighteousness and live out unrighteousness because our hearts are broken. Our hearts are, are sinful, right? Captive and infected at the deepest levels by them. Jesus says, so it's out of that that flows all these different sinful things. And Jesus says here, if you want to be happy, if you want to be blessed, if you want to have a blissful life, then what you must do is not lean into the things that come naturally in these long lists, but step away from them and seek and pursue righteousness. You must put to death those sinful things, in fact. We're told to pursue in Galatians 5, 22 through 25, the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. For against these things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. All the things in the other lists should be being put to death by the Christian. For if we live by the Spirit, he says, let us then keep in step with the Spirit. So, what does it mean to pursue 
to pursue righteousness? Well, it first means to put to death the, the sinful nature that we have, to put to death these things that are in this long list of sins and unrighteous activity, even just from the, the few verses that I cited now. And it means orienting our lives around things that the Bible would tell us are good things, righteous things, things that draw us closer to the presence of God, the righteous one, right? So first and foremost, it's, it's Bible study, right? It's an act of, of not righteousness that will save us, but a righteousness that should draw us closer to God when we engage in it, right? And we need to, to, to kind of be clear. Bible reading and Bible study are not the same things. Bible reading is like the start. You got to start there. You got to read the Bible. You got to get in. But that's not enough. It's not enough to just, okay, you know, flip through, read, check mark off. Like, we need to read the Bible, but we need to go further than that. We need to step into really studying. What does this say? What does this mean? What did it mean to them? How does it apply to my life? We got to do some work. We gotta do some work to study, to learn, to grow, to ponder, to meditate. That's really the goal. Because it's through those things we get closer to God. Prayer is another thing that the, the person who is actively pursuing God and pursuing righteousness will engage in. It's talking with God, it's confessing our sins, it's repenting, it's asking for his forgiveness, it's seeking his wisdom and his leading and his work in our life, it's sharing our burdens, giving him our anxieties as he has invited us to do, right? This is something the, the person who is eagerly seeking after righteousness will do. Gathering with God's people, like we're doing tonight is another command of Scripture that, that we should do. If we want to flee from the things that would tempt us and distract us, we get together with God's people. <laughs> so we can encourage one another and build one another up in the faith. We don't forsake this gathering that we have, but we lean into it. We, we press into other spiritual disciplines, like engaging in, in worship, like we've talked about before, right? It's like we even sang this morning, right? I can come in here, and I can refuse to praise, and I can just... just to kind of stand here and do my thing, wait for it to be over, or I can choose to worship. <laughs> and if we get closer to God, we have to choose to worship and press into that. We have to join in the mission of God. We have to, we have to evangelize. Like all of us are called to be witnesses of Jesus Christ, sharing our faith. That's not just my job. That's not just the job of the missionaries, not just the job of the, the ordained evangelist who we send out. All of us are called to participate in the mission of God and share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. The more we do that, the closer we are with God. That's his heart, to bring the lost into himself, right? So the more we're on mission with him, the closer we are to him, the more blessed we are. Blessedness, happiness comes really from stewarding our resources with eternity in mind. Giving, giving to God, not just spending for self. There's real joy that comes when we put God first with our resources, rather than giving him whatever's just left over. There's a way to get closer to God as we pursue righteousness through, through fasting. He tells us to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Then, then fasting, taking away food and drink for a period of time, can help us really understand and feel the reality of what it is we're supposed to be pursuing, how we're supposed to be acting towards God. And we can find righteousness growing in us as we get closer to God through silence and, and solitude. Setting aside the other things in our lives and, and stepping into moments where, okay, it's just me and God, meditation on his word, listening for his voice, worshiping him without the distractions of the phone, of, of books, of journals, of to-do lists, whatever else, just silence and solitude, time between me and God. If we are hungry and if we are thirsty for righteousness, the promise is we will one day be satisfied. That, that text in Revelation tells us he will fully satisfy. There will be no more hunger, no more thirst there. But I think what, what you and I can find in this life, too, is satisfaction, joy in this pursuit of God as we long for him and we hunger and we thirst for him. We'll find that to be a much more satisfying, not easier, <laughs> may make our lives a lot more difficult, but a much more satisfying, a much more meaningful life comes when we hunger and thirst after God and his righteousness. I like the words of, of uh, Pastor John Piper. He's distilling Edwards, and Edwards is, is incredible and wonderful, but I've read the passages that, that Edwards writes about this idea, and he's not nearly as memorable as the way John Piper puts it. Piper says this, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. How do you find satisfaction in God? It's being with him. It's pursuing him. It's following his ways. It's, it's going after righteousness like we need it. We're hungry, we're thirsty, and that's the solution. And when we find that pursuit is the definition of our life, we'll find the most satisfaction and God will get the most glory 
out of our lives, which is what we should want, every one of us, right? That's our aim. So, Jesus says the way to true happiness, the way to true blessedness is to hunger and thirst after righteousness. And he promises that those who do will be satisfied.